Words and papers, words and books, words on TV, words for cooks, words for... Welcome to the world of Wordaholics. Yes, this is Wordaholics, a support group for adverb addicts, jargon junkies, and looking at our audience today, people who just wanted to get out of the rain. <laughs> I'm Charles Brandreth, and I shall be your tour guide through the winding corridors of the Museum of Lexicography, pausing only to force you to buy something from the gift shop on the way out. <laughs> and talking of gifts, meet this week's Wordaholics. They all have the gift of the gab. They are Paul Sinner and Arthur Smith, Natalie Haynes and Michael Rosen. Of course, some words are more popular than others. When English is written, the ten most frequently used words are the and a, that, I, of, to, in, is, and it. But I'd like my guests to tell me which words they most overuse. Paul Sinner. Mine is 29. <laughs> uh, I'm 41 years old, Giles, and I've been single now since 1991. And I'm euphemistically a confirmed bachelor. And I come from a world where if you're over the age of about 23, you're deemed a fit for the trash heap. So in all adverts I ever post on dating sites, I'm officially 29. <laughs> and that is why that's my most overused word. Oh, and you have a good sense of humour. I do, yes, but that's not... G-S-O-H isn't really a word, it's horrific English. Oh, it isn't. Arthur Smith, which word do you think you most overuse? When it appeared, it was so ridiculous that I took to deliberately using it almost as an act of counter-attack uh, uh, in it, and I've ended up actually using it uh, in it. Uh, and I'm afraid that every now and again, even without trying, just because I've used it so much as a bit of a gag, it's, I've started using it in it. And similarly, with a really annoying word, big time. You know. <laughs> yeah. So you're using in well, it, you big, know, big time. time you? It, well, how do you use big time? It's, uh, yeah, yeah, big time. You know, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and big time is another one that I found myself using. You know, it's hard. Even we, great grammarians and uh, lexicologic, lexicological... Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's really not the right word to stumble on. <laughs> but we, you know, we, we are not immune to these uh, strange things, in it. I am ashamed of saying Brillo. <laughs> I text it to my children, some of whom are very young and some of whom are old, but when they write to me and say, I will see you on Friday, I text back Brillo. And they go, they go into Tesco and buy the pads, do they? And come home thinking they're doing an errand for Daddy. Yes. And perhaps even worse, I also text GD. Oh, GD. Yeah, good, as if, like, life is so busy and there are so That's many things to do you. You do that not... there is only time to text GD. If you don't like the word, you can do what the Cockneys do and text Michael Portillo. Is that rhyming slang? It's for? rhyming slang for Brillo. It's official rhyming slang, Michael Portillo. Right. So Something I now is... just text back Michael. Yes, that's how it works. <laughs> or Michael. <laughs> uh, Natalie. The word I probably overuse the most is pleasantries, because in 1984, the BBC did an adaptation of John Macefield's children's book, The Box of Delights, and it was lovely, and I used to watch it every Christmas. I still do watch it every Christmas. Why am I pretending? Um, <laughs> and uh, in it, the villain, who is Robert Stevens, um, he scrobbles lots of uh, bishops and things and then nearly kills them at the end. I'm sorry to give it away, but in fairness, you have had 27 years to watch it. Um, <laughs> and uh, eventually, he nearly kills them by opening a flood or something, and they all nearly drown. And the Bishop of Tatchester, who's played by John Horsley, goes... These pleasantries must cease. <laughs> and it's such a brilliant phrase. I'm, I'm at the end of my tether, but I have got lovely manners. <laughs> and so often do I find myself almost spitting with rage at somebody being annoying that at least three or four times a day I go, These pleasantries must cease! <laughs> Good. Well, I think these pleasantries must cease. <laughs> it's time now for our first round, the letter of the week. And will you please welcome this week's letter? It's the letter X. Here she comes, the letter X, looking absolutely exquisite as she sashays down the Wordaholics catwalk. 
What a fabulous figure of a letter. Her arms and legs spread extravagantly wide. And all parts in perfect proportion. There's a deliciously decadent feeling about this letter. Not so much fin de siècle as fin de alphabet. To lovers she carries with her the promise of a kiss. To those who can't write their own name, she's a signature dish. <laughs> While you might consider some of her behavior X-rated, it's certain that everyone who beholds her would be left in a state of ecstasy. If only you spelt it that way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the letter X. Ah, X, she's marked my spot a few times, I can tell you. Paul, the first question is for you. What does it mean to give someone the XX? Is this what an Australian barman does? Somebody orders a half pint. <laughs> It's not Australian, it's American English from the 1920s. Is it an American barman illegally serving a half pint of Australian lager? <laughs> You've got to be really literal-minded here to score your points. A double X is a... Your double cross. cross. Yeah, a double cross. A oh, double X double is a double cross. cross. Yeah. Yes. OK. Arthur Smith, what would it mean if I shed Xerxes' tears? And that Xerxes spelt the traditional. I think it would mean you were unable to finish the crossword. Uh, That's a clever answer. Or, or I mean, uh, Xerxes. Who was? Or Xerxes? maybe it's fear of uh, fear of noughts and crosses. Or uh, Xerxes wasn't he a general? Or... Yeah, he was a general. Persian. He was a Persian. He, was a Persian. He, led the, he led the Persians against the Greeks in the first half of the fifth century BCE. And his tears then were what? Uh, uh, the, the, he fought the, the three hundred. You know the three hundred Spartans at the hot gates at oh, Thermopylae. Yeah. He's it's his forces that see them. He wept there. for them, perhaps. He did weep for them. Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, uh, he was indeed the commander, and what Xerxes' tears are is a commander's concern for the lives of his troops. So, Arthur, you actually get four full points for that. <laughs> Natalie, what are the distinguishing characteristics of a Xerox queen? X-E-R-O-X, queen. Oh, Matt, I haven't had an office job since the early 90s. I couldn't have the question about Xerxes. Um, is it a new superhero? No, it Someone isn't. Someone from the X-Men? No. Is it a camp superhero who can produce a photocopy at will? Ah! What? Ah, <laughs> no, you're getting isn't. close. The camp element gets you close and the photocopier gets you close. Yes, there is an element here of both. Replication. Oh, it's uh, somebody, somebody who dates somebody who looks exactly like them. A Xerox queen is indeed a gay gentleman who likes all of his partners to look broadly the same. Oh. Yeah. Are you a Xerox king, Giles? No, there isn't a Xerox queen. There's a Radox queen, which is a gay gentleman who likes to unwind with a relaxing bubble bath. <laughs> Michael, slightly different one for you. When was the word Xmas first used? Now, your man Swift hated abbreviations. He constantly moaned about the fact that people called citizens sits, which you have to say very, very carefully. Um, so I'm going to guess it's round about Dean Swift's time. It's a little bit earlier than that. Is it? Yeah. It first appears in print in 1551. Ooh. And there's a common misconception that the word is a secular attempt to take the Christ out of Christmas, but of course that isn't the case. It is simply an abbreviation, Xmas. Like good, good, GD. <laughs> yeah. And the Christian Kai, to start off with, was an X and not a sort of T halfway down. In all my notes at A level, where I had to write Christian, Christian, Christian in my ancient history. There's always a Kai and then an N, an X N, always. Okay, we're all terrified of something, whether it's heights, the dark or the thought that somewhere out there, Robert Kilroy Silk is plotting his return to television. <laughs> this round is all about phobias. I'm going to be giving each of our wordaholics the name of a phobia, and we'll see if they know which specific fear it refers to. Arthur, I'm going to come to you first. What might your problem be if you were suffering from dipnophobia? Fear of nappies. <laughs> <laughs> Fear of being approached by someone called Daphne. <laughs> Natalie, do you actually know the answer to this one? Is it dining? It is indeed. Come on! How do you get to dining? Because I think dipno, dipno is the Greek for I eat, I dine. It I is think. indeed. I've got a degree in this. Don't be too impressed. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Dipnophobia is from the Greek to eat, to dine, and dipnophobia is a fear of conversations at dinner. 
Not something I suffer from myself. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Paul Sinner. Actually, why were you struck off? You never got... <laughs> we, we never got round to that, did we? I was certainly not struck off, Giles. Those what? rumours are patently untrue. Ah. You're a former medical man, so I'm mm. sure you'll have an unfair advantage this one. What would your problem be if you were suffering from gelotophobia? G-E-L-O-T-O. Phobia. G-E-L gel is the Aramaic for gel. So it's, it, it's, it's a fear of getting gel in your ears, or more specifically, a fear of clumsy hairstylists in general. It isn't, of course, but as a result of having your hair absurdly done, you might have this fear. Laughter. Laughter. Gosh, who has that? I hope they don't come to my show. <laughs> <laughs> I've had them in before. <laughs> Does it have to be mocking laughter or it's just laughter? We get a bonus for that, actually. It is a fear of being laughed at. Natalie, I'm going to ask you to grapple with a phobia now. Can you tell us what the problem would be if you were suffering from cherophobia? I'm pretty sure it's not fear of share. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure a Xerox queen wouldn't have that. Um, I think it's a hard CH. Cherophobia. Chirophobia. Chir joy. Rejoice. It's a fear of joy. It's a fear of joy, of gaiety, of happiness, a fear of happy things. You score four points. <laughs> Finally, we come to you, Michael Rosen. Can you tell us, in your near infinite wisdom, what you might be suffering from if you were prone to attacks of consecutolaliophobia? <laughs> fear of being unable to say words. <laughs> I'm afraid this one has done the rounds on the internet a little bit. Um, so I know this one, and um, it means if you um, have a fear of chopsticks. Mm. Ah. Consecotaliophobia is a fear of chopsticks. Not the tune, but the eating utensils used by the Chinese. Let's follow that up by getting you to come up with your own wholly original contributions to the canon of phobias. What do you think should be recognised as a bona fide Phobia. I've got one. Uh, nope. No Downtonophobia. <laughs> which is the fear of the ending of a series of Downton Abbey. <laughs> and Sunday nights open up like a grim vacuum. <laughs> Mine is not entirely different. The fear of being stuck in a job years after you should have retired called Bruce Forsythophobia. <laughs> Natalie, have you got one to offer? I know that the fear of fear itself should be the most potent fear, and that would be phobophobia. But then it seems to me that if that exists, you should be able to be afraid of developing it, which would be phobophobia phobia. So that's not what I want. I would like not to have it. Phobophobia phobia. That sounds a little bit like someone coming downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly if they owned a telephone, because then they'd be phonophobia phobia phobia phobia. <laughs> Do you have any phobias, Giles, other than silence? <laughs> Michael, what fears do you think deserve wider recognition? I'm very afraid, I think I'm allowed to mention this, I'm very, very afraid of Microsoft. <laughs> I just, I cannot get my head round Microsoft in any way at all. So I was hoping maybe Natalie would help me here. We need a Latin or a Greek word for soft, mansuetor. See, I don't think it is a phobia, though, because a phobia is an irrational fear. <laughs> Oh, right, yes, that's a point. So I think what you've got is a perfectly rational fear. I don't think it is a phobia. Is it a complex? It's, it's a reasonable approach to life. OK, so I have <laughs> Microsoft rational aversion. Yes, you do, yeah. Thank you. You have the same fear of Microsoft that other people would have of, say, death. <laughs> that's OK. That's a rational fear. I feel a lot better. I didn't okay. know this programme was therapy, but that's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, That's Giles. all right. That's the least we can do. We'll send the bill in later. <laughs> but I have bad news for anyone suffering from metathesiophobia, which is a fear of change, because it's the end of the round. Let me take a look at the scores, and I see... Oh, Paul Sinner and Arthur Smith. Arthur, you've scored some extra bonuses for some of your quips, mm. but nothing for any of your answers. <laughs> you've got 12 points. Natalie and Michael are in the lead, though. 
Much like a scalpel, words can be sharp, dangerous, and if you don't handle them carefully, you can end up covered from head to toe in blood. The next round is called Not in So Many Words, in which our panel will tread delicately through the minefield of language to avoid a particularly tricky situation. I'm going to throw this question out to the panel. How would you tell your husband, your wife, your partner, your significant other that the haircut that they have just received is hideous? The thing is, with hair, it grows again. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. But sadly, Arthur, in your case and mine, it doesn't. (laughs) (laughs) Paul. I love you so much that it becomes so intense sometimes that I can't look at you directly for four to six weeks. (laughs) Michael. Very egotistical, but I say, do you want to borrow my beard trimmer? (laughs) Natalie. I think I would like to go for, it makes you look rich and successful, darling. Like Donald Trump. (laughs) Very good. We move on now to professions and pastimes that develop their own language and terminology. This round we call Terms of the Trade, and in it I give our wordaholics a selection from the lexicon of a particular job or pastime, and they have to guess or may know what kind of person would use a word like that. Let's see if our panel know what type of people might use these words. Chop cup. Haunted hank. Ambitious card. Silk. Who might use these words? It's like card sharp. Somehow I could see it in a casino in Las Vegas. You might well see this in a casino in Las Vegas, but it wouldn't necessarily be a gambler. Someone selling ice cream. No. (laughs) You're close with cards, but not with gambling. A magician playing with cards? A magician is the correct answer. You score the four (laughs) points right away. Well done, Michael Rosen. A chop cup is a piece of apparatus from the famous cup and ball routine. Uh, The ambitious card is a trick where a selected card continually rises to the top of the deck wherever it's placed, playing card version of uh, Peter Mandelson. And um, (laughs) a haunted hank is an effect where a handkerchief begins to dance around almost as if possessed by the spirit of Louis Spence. (laughs) And a silk is a term that magicians use to refer to a handkerchief typically made of silk. A cotton polyester mix doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? The ambitious... I hate close-up magic. <laughs> Please yeah. don't do any jars. I bet you can. I can. <laughs> I can, he is, yes. Oh, oh I can. What a surprise. Oh, yes. You made the seat of Chester disappear in 1907. <laughs> <laughs> hey, very good. OK, another batch of exotic yet specific vocabulary for you. Who might use words like these? Power oil. Dream pillows, fertility salad, saliva. I know this is, this is uh, gay nightclub workers. (laughs) Isn't it, Paul? (laughs) Not sure about the fertility pillow. Not that I know about (laughs) these things, but anyway. Nothing to do with gay nightclubs, but the night might have something to do with it. These people often perform their work under darkness. A a religious thing? Ah. Uh, there is a spiritual element to this. Is it undertakers? No, no not Grave undertakers. Diggers. Graves, we're getting closer and closer. Oh. Witches! Witches! Hey. Hey. And these are all terms associated with witches. They're taken from the book Everyday Witchcraft. Power oil consists of ingredients that resonate with you strongly. Baked beans, for example. Um, <laughs> Dream pillows are sachets made of herbs that you place under your pillow. They act upon the subconscious. A fertility salad is a dish that a modern witch might prepare to ensure sexual success. Personally, I can't go far wrong with a bunch of flowers and a tuna niçoise. (laughs) Saliva is considered by witches to be the most powerful bodily fluid and can be used to personalise spells. So if you see a woman in a pointy hat shouting abracadabra and spitting at you, you know she's just trying to add that extra little personal touch. (laughs) If you want to find out the best sorcery, you look in Witch Witch magazine. (laughs) And here's another collection of terms for you. Who would use words like these? But ending. (laughs) Dump and chase. Fight strap. Odd man rush. I'm going for archery. Michael Rosen goes for archery. They are sporting terms, but not archery. Wrestling. Wrestling, neither. You've got to move about, I think, more gracefully than a wrestler might. 
not fencing either. Gymnastics. Now think about the terms. Bull ending, dump and chase. Picture the dump of the chase. American football? Now we're into North America. I think we're even further than North America. We're into the north of North America. We're into Canada. Ice this hockey. Ice hockey. Ice hockey. Yeah. If we, I mean, if, if this was Canadian radio, it would be ice hockey programs, 23 and a half hours a day, then wordaholics. <laughs> One problem, though. In Canada, they wouldn't call it ice hockey. What do they call, call it? Hockey. Of course, because it's a way of life. The other stuff that we play, they call field hockey. I ice. don't play hockey at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anyone? Have yeah. you played hockey, Charles? Have I played? When in Canada, I always do what the Canadians do. <laughs> and I do it with a Canadian accent. They like that. Oh, They're please. always flattered by that, but you're right. Uh, these are all terms to do with ice hockey. Butt ending is the act of jabbing an opponent with the end of your stick. Quite a Canadian thing to do. Uh, dump and chase is an offensive strategy, and it certainly sounds offensive to me. <laughs> used to get the puck over the opposing team's blue line. I said that quite carefully. Uh, a fight strap is a strap inside a jersey that loops through the belt so that it may not be pulled over a player's head during a fight. And we used something quite similar to that at Prime Minister's Questions in the old days. <laughs> An odd man rush is when a team enters the attacking zone and outnumbers the opposing players in the zone. Of course, an odd man rush is also what you get when they open the doors of a sci-fi convention. <laughs> okay. New words for old. In our next round, I'm going to test our panel to see if they can figure out the meaning of some words that probably haven't been spoken in centuries. And we're just waiting for this week's guest dictionary to be fetched down from the shelves. Thank you, Chardonnay. This is my favourite book. This is Francis Gross's The 1811 Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. <laughs> Essential reading if you ever want to have a foul-mouthed argument with someone who's been dead for 200 years. <laughs> so, Paul Sinner, I'm going to turn to you first and ask, what are able wackets? I think this is the um, earliest form of tennis designed purely for people with a speech impediment. <laughs> Well, they have wheelchair tennis at the uh, Paralympics. They might have special tennis with people with speech impediments. And the word able has been included, which makes it politically correct, you know? Yes. But no, is the answer. That's Are they not criminal it? gangs selling early editions of the Bible that only contain the story of Cain and Abel? <laughs> <laughs> There's a physical element to this. The wackets are indeed blows given to a certain part of the body. It's getting mucky again. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. really He's doing a sort of strange revolving twisting thing, isn't the he? Palm. Like it's when you hit someone on the palm. Slapping someone round the mush with the back of your hand. The palm of your hand is where you want to be. Oh. And what are you swacking it with? Cane. A twisted handkerchief. <laughs> cool. Oh, yeah, 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 Able wackets are blows given on the palm of the hand with a twisted handkerchief. A punishment among who when playing cards? Please. Nuns. <laughs> I got caned with a bamboo thingy. Stick? Yeah, yeah, stick, that was the word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been to that nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> this was a punishment among sailors when playing cards, the loser suffering as many strokes as he lost games. <laughs> Natalie Haynes, can you tell me what is meant by chummage? Is it like a scrummage? but friendlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a friendly element to it. People are playing cribbage. Not people playing cribbage. Is it liquefied dog food made by pedigree? <laughs> Is it a friend who looks like a scarecrow? <laughs> no, but I might just add that the types of people who paid this money, they were incarcerated. Prisoners. prisoners. They were prisoners. When the prisons were very full, two or three prisoners... Would escape. Oh, you... <laughs> You pay somebody so you can have their dinner, so you can have their, their bed, bed. Their, bed. Their, bed. Their, their picture of Rita Hayworth. Is it Rita <laughs> Hayworth that's on the You're absolutely right. When the prisons were very full, two or three prisoners might have to share a cell, but the richer prisoners could pay the poorer prisoners to give up their share, and it was called chummage. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. That's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm. Interesting is a strong word, Giles, but... Um... <laughs> OK, Arthur, can you tell us what is meant by the word clapper Dodgian. No, I can't. But, and frankly, <laughs> there's no way of knowing. You've just got to have wild guesses. It probably doesn't sound anything like a word anyway. I suppose Clapper might be someone applauding, but I bet it is. And I might as well just make anything up. It's someone who <laughs> puts arsenic on a wound to make it look better to get sympathy. <laughs> Congratulations, four points. <laughs> But that's a slightly loose interpretation of the word. <laughs> a clapper dodgian. 
Exactly. Someone who... Dogen is like a doge you had in it, Venice, didn't had, you? How do you spell the dogen bit? Uh, the dogen bit is spelled D-O-G-E-O-N. Clapper <laughs> is as in the clappers. It's somebody who's born really without anything. It's somebody who is... Not born at all. Well, no. <laughs> they're, they're, on their, they're on their clappers, which might have been a way of saying they're on their uppers. It's someone who was born on their uppers. A pauper. A pauper. Someone who was born a pauper or a beggar is a clapper dogian. So what was wrong with pauper? Nothing was wrong with pauper. <laughs> oh, actually, even shorter than that, what's wrong with poor? No, nothing is wrong with poor or pauper, but it won't work with my joke about the old children's card game, clapper dogian my neighbour. Well, that's the reason why we chose to use it. <laughs> <laughs> you get a point for that. I'll give you one more. Michael Rosen, can you tell us what we mean when we use the word rantipole? R-A-N-T-I-P-O-L-E. Uh, someone who's like a uh, maypole, but ranting. Yes, somebody who's going to be giddy around a maypole. Wild. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being wild round a maypole. You are. You're being a rude, romping boy or girl. I am. A gadabout. That's yeah. what you are. That's a rantipole. It's more usually used about a female than a male. A oh. rantipole is a dissipated woman. And if you find that hard to understand, just picture the cast of The Only Way is Essex. <laughs> It's like a Dutch lager, doesn't it? Pint of rantipole. Oh, yeah, rantipole. Or a very angry builder. A rantipole, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, that flurry of linguistic dreary pokery brings us to the end of the show, and I see from my score sheet that, oh, my goodness, Paul and Arthur did some very good scoring now and again. But the more consistent players, let's face it, were Natalie and Michael, who, with 28 points, are this week's winners. Congratulations. In a word, Natalie, how do you describe your experience of winning this week? Well, since we did galotophobia earlier with fear of laughter, I think it would be galotophilia. I had a love of laughter the Aww. whole time. Uh, Michael? I love the word gallimorphy. I think it means a sort of hodgepodge, potpourri-ish thing, and we were pretty gallimorphy-ish. You were. A glorious gallimorphy from yeah. Natalie and Michael. What does failure bring to mind this week? <laughs> You two, Arthur and Paul. What's the word, Paul, that sums up your experience here today? 29 GSOH Xerox Queen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my word is over. <laughs> <laughs> Which it is, and that brings us to the end of this week's Wordaholics. Will you please thank one more time our wonderful guests, Paul Sinner, Arthur Smith, Natalie Haynes and Michael Rosen. <laughs> Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Wordaholics chaired by Giles Brandreth. Tracy Wiles is the reader. It's written by John Hunter and James Kettle. And the producer is Claire Jones. 